You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. So working as a server, tips are pretty much your entire income. In Rhode Island, the hourly wage for tipped employees is $3 an hour, and it's even lower in other states. Um, I have a friend who is from Atlanta who worked at a country club for something like $1 an hour a couple of years back. So the pressure of performing for tips is always pretty significant. Um, And while I can't really think of like a particular moment where working for tips influenced my behavior. There have been many instances, obviously, where customers have been rude to me or raised their voices at me, and I've had to swallow it and smile and do my best to be understanding. Um, In real life, I'm definitely not the kind of person that would allow someone to speak to me like that, but working for tips really forces you to be numb to that kind of stuff so you can get paid. That was Charlotte. She works as a server in Providence, Rhode Island. Almost all tipped workers in the restaurant industry have stories like hers, of biting their tongues in order to ensure that they make enough money in tips at the end of the night. This week on Meet and 3, we're examining what happens the moment the check arrives. We hear about the lived experience of being a tipped worker, before turning to academics and advocates to explain the history and politics of tipping and how a very different payment model could potentially fight against food insecurity. Oftentimes, the ways we pay for our food go unquestioned, yet these stories prompt us to reimagine payment to better support the dignity of workers and eaters alike. After all, a few dollars can make a big difference. I'm Matt Patterson, and this is Meet and 3 on HRN. Meet and 3. Meet and 3. Meet and 3. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meat and three. For our first story, Clara Thompson speaks to a friend who has worked as a server, a restaurant manager, and a sommelier about her personal experience as a tipped worker in the industry. In recent months, inflation and the rise of tipping fatigue have brought the legitimacy of the tipping pay structure into question. The structure is complicated, and its effect on workers is not always clear-cut. To understand the relationship between tipper and tippy in New York City fine dining, I talked to Emma, an old friend and a current sommelier in New York City. When I moved to New York, it was like, okay, what am I going to do? Of course, I'm going to continue in the service industry. And honestly, like that is where a lot of my passion lies, although it's tricky. There is security in being a salaried employee, but nothing can beat the gratification of a great money night. It's nice to know as a salaried employee, like every single week I get this paycheck and it's wonderful. But I mean, like as a tips employee, there's some days that will just surprise you and like will be just like such a good money day. And being a tipped employee has a major effect on work ethic. Like a big thing that's been hammered into me through this industry is like the phrase, like, don't be lazy. Um, Because like, especially like in a tip pool environment, it's like every single person in that pool matters and the work that they're doing is mattering. And like, definitely when I was salaried, it was something where I was like, I don't really like, I don't really like this. Like I like, you know, knowing that I could possibly like, if I had a harder night, I, like I would come away from it. But the rush of a great tip night does not take away from the way a server can feel when they receive a bad tip. I mean, back when I was a server, I was really just like more focused on like, okay, how can everything be as flawless as possible, I'm still enjoying myself, and hopefully they are too. Um, I think that something that was so disheartening for me as like a server was 
you know, like those little like toast machines, like seeing them actually like put in the tip, like right there in front of you, like in terms of like feeling valued on the floor and then like feeling like you have no control that's when it really starts to hit because it's like okay like I know that I just gave you really good service and I'm watching you give me 18 percent in front of me. Despite the difficulties of the tipping model Emma thinks the tipping model is here to stay. A lot of people on the floor are actually happy with the tipping model. But then at the same time, it's like, okay, well, people need to be tipping right for the tipping model to be something that people are happy with. And since the tipping model is likely here to stay, it's important for customers to understand that the tip is truly how you show your appreciation for your dining experience. Okay, the grand finale, you pay. The way you show your appreciation is through the tip. That's your way of showing your appreciation for that valued effort by, you know, the whole staff. There's still, like, so many actual human beings that are making that experience happen for you. Um, And so to be disrespectful is, yeah, it's really just unfortunate. So I I would hope that people, when they go out to just even have, like, their quick fix, it's like understand that there are so many bodies that are like actually like spending their night to cater to you. It's easy to feel more pressure than ever when it comes to tipping. From selecting the right percentage on an iPad to frantic calculations after a big group meal, what was acceptable just a few years ago is worthy of ridicule today. You may be wondering how we got this system in the first place. For some insight, here's an excerpt from Shiftwork, HRN's collaboration with the Restaurant Workers Community Foundation. Guest Saru Jayaraman is an attorney and activist who talks about the history of tipping in America and present-day politics of tipping culture. It's important to know the history of this issue. Um, The sub-minimum wage in the U.S. started at emancipation of slavery when the restaurant industry wanted the ability to hire Black people, Black women in particular, not pay them anything, essentially continue slavery, and have them live on this newfangled idea that had just come to Europe at the time called tipping. Um, So they mutated the notion of tipping, which prior to emancipation had always been an extra or bonus on top of a wage. They mutated it at emancipation in the United States to becoming a replacement for wages so that they could basically pay black women nothing. And that became law in 1938 as part of the New Deal when everybody got the right to the minimum wage for the first time except for millions of black workers and tipped restaurant workers were left out. They were given a $0 wage and told they had to live on tips. And we went from zero in 1938 all the way up to $2.13 an hour today. The federal minimum wage for tipped workers in the United States of America, which is a huge workforce, is still $2.13 an hour in 2022. Restaurant workers can no longer afford to rely on tips, and the great resignation hit the industry hard. One million restaurant workers have left the industry during the pandemic. And of those who remain, 54% of restaurant workers who remain say they're leaving. 80% say the only thing that would make them come back to working in restaurants is a full livable wage with tips on top. When you've got 54% of those who are left saying they're leaving, you really only have two choices as a country. Either we can cut the industry in half, you know, expect half the... You know, ability to eat out on Valentine's Day, half the Sunday brunches, half the date nights, or we raise the wage. They're the really only two options at this point. Many businesses were responsive to the idea of a living wage and tips. However, restaurant workers need effective policies to ensure they can stay in the industry. So many restaurants across the country have voluntarily transitioned to a full minimum wage, no longer paying a sub-minimum wage to tipped workers because it's the only way to get workers to come back to work in the restaurant industry. But even they have joined forces with a lot of workers and a lot of these small businesses that have raised wages and said, saying, listen, we're raising wages to recruit staff to come back, 
but we can't do it alone. We need policy to make it a level playing field. And we need policy to signal to millions of workers, this is going to be permanent, not temporary change. Until such policies come about, when your bill arrives at the table, know that your tip is so much more than a thank you. We'll be right back with more Meet and 3 after a brief break. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome back to Meet in 3. Next up, Kate Dario talks to Teo Reyes, Chief Program Officer of Restaurant Workers United, about his work advocating for increased wages for restaurant workers. No matter where you choose to eat, American restaurant dining culture is defined by the tip. It is so baked into the fabric of our daily lives that most of us don't even think about it until we travel abroad and find ourselves handed a bill that doesn't require multiplication to pay. But what does this practice look like for the workers whose wage rests upon a diner's non-guaranteed generosity? How did one of the largest sectors of the American workforce come to rely on tips? And how can we imagine a future beyond them? Today, we speak with Teo Reyes, Chief Program Officer of Restaurant Workers United, to answer these questions and more. First, it is important to understand what kind of culture and experience relying on tips creates for the workers in this environment. Federally, the subminimum wage for tipped workers is $2.13 an hour. And so if you're only earning $2.13 an hour, that means that effectively your wage is being paid by the customers. The tip is your wage. It's not a gratuity. It's actually your wage. And so you're completely dependent on the whims of the customer in a way that removes responsibility from the employer. And in fact, the employer encourages behavior that leads towards you getting sufficient tips so that they're not in any way responsible for for your wage itself, right? Now, what that means is that, again, in states where you have a, a low subminimum wage, uh, you're going to simply put up with different kinds of behavior than you would when your wage is not dependent on that tip. Factors like race and gender greatly inform the experience of tipped workers often shaping what roles they have in a restaurant and how they are treated in the workplace. The restaurant industry is majority women, uh, 54% women nationally. But then when you look at uh, back of the house workers, that will be majority men. And when you look at tipped workers, it is overwhelmingly uh, women. So over two thirds of all tipped workers are, are women. Um, in the restaurant industry, there's a lot of segregation in the industry, both by race and gender. And so on the one hand, if you group workers together uh, based on the occupations that they dominate and the earning potential, you see that the percentage of white workers increases as the earning potential increases and the percentage of male workers increase as the percentage uh, as the earning potential increases as well. So when you're looking at women of color, if you're looking at black women, at, at uh, Latino women in particular, what you're going to find is that they're going to face much higher rates of discrimination. So they're denied opportunities 
in front of the house settings in fine dining restaurants, for example. Uh, but at the same time, they're going to be pushed to occupy uh, the vast majority of front of the house positions in, in restaurants where the tipping, where, where the potential to earn tips is much lower. Relying on tips can create a particularly precarious work environment where typical workplace boundaries blur, resulting in workers potentially being taken advantage of. If your work is dependent, again, as I said, on tips, you're more likely to accept behaviors that you might not want to accept otherwise. And so you don't really want to go through the hassle of, you know, having a big table that you're serving at and having them not leave you a tip because they somehow got offended with what you said, right? Or because, you know, they asked you to, to smile and instead of smiling, you just sort of, you know, just tried to maintain a professional, at, um, uh, you know, approach to, to your workload, et cetera. You know, if you crouch down so you're at eye level with, with a customer when you're interacting with them, that's more likely to give you a higher tip. You know, if you put little emoji smile face on the bill, that's going to encourage a psychologically, it seems to encourage a higher tip. But all these types of behaviors can send the wrong signal to customers, and then they, you know, t take that the wrong way, and then you have to put up with someone who is trying to interpret your behavior to their, you know, to their benefit. And so that's 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 a, a, you know, those are some of the challenges that that people face. And on the other hand, is that for over half of the workforce in the country, the first uh, job environment they're going to have is going to be in a restaurant. And so if you're learning that these types of um, putting up with these type of behaviors are normal or accepted, that sort of puts you in a frame of reference that's, that that's normal or acceptable in any, in any other work environment. Rock United fights for a world beyond a sub-minimum wage, beyond these inequalities in wage earning. Well, overall, we call for a thriving wage. So it's not sufficient. First of all, we need to do away with the sub-minimum wage. You know, the industry will tell you that, oh, if we raise wages, if we have to pay a full minimum wage, we're not going to be able to hire workers with the, the industry is not going to survive. And the fact of the matter is every state that pays a higher wage does as well or better than the states that pay lower wages. And so the first thing that needs to happen is that there needs to be a full minimum wage for everybody. And that wage needs to be a lot higher than what it is now. The federal minimum wage, $7.25 an hour. Uh, it's impossible to live anywhere in the country off of seven twenty-five an hour, and so we're, you know, we're looking at at least fifteen-dollar minimum wage that's needed. But then on top of that, if you're a single uh, parent, uh, you know, the the living wage becomes a lot higher, uh, and so you need to make sure that you have access to childcare, access to health care, uh, etc. At most American restaurants, customers decide how much they wish to tip. But for our final story, we turn to establishments where the customers determine what they wish to pay for their entire order. Liv Cummins Berkowitz interviews Julie Williams about pay what you can restaurants and the fight against food insecurity. In 2017, Julie and Jeff Williams founded Taste Community Restaurant in Fort Worth, Texas. Taste Community Restaurant operates with a pay what you can model. Meaning, when the check comes, instead of set prices, customers pay only what they are able. We've got Chef Jeff there, um, and he provides a seasonal menu that sort of changes as the seasons evolve. So the menu at Taste literally just changed last week. So my <laughs> my current go-to order <laughs> is a half whole wheat waffle with homemade breakfast sausage. It's amazing. When opening Taste Community Restaurant, Julie and Jeff consulted with One World Everybody Eats, a national nonprofit that supports the establishment of pay-what-you-can community cafes across the U.S. Julie quickly realized she wanted to help spread community cafes beyond Fort Worth and join the board of One World Everybody Eats. And since 2019, Julie has served as their board president. I spoke to Julie about One World Everybody Eats vision for combating food insecurity and crafting community. I will tell you that each community cafe is really as unique as the communities that they serve. And so it looks a little bit different in every single community. For example, um, a place at the table in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
operates with some suggested prices listed next to each of the items. And when folks reach the register, they're asked uh, if they would like to uh, donate the suggested amount, donate less than the suggested amount, or donate more than the suggested amount. Alternatively, for example, in Fort Worth, Texas, Taste Community Restaurant operates a full-service restaurant, so folks come in, sit down at a table, order off a menu that has no prices, and at the end, a ticket comes to the table, just like a traditional restaurant, but instead of prices, it has blank lines. Although the menu, ambiance, and payment model vary, the one world everybody eats community cafes all adhere to the same seven core principles. We believe that providing a dignified dining experience uh, with the ability for folks to determine what they can pay allows folks to assess, you know, that don't have a whole lot can still provide what they have and be recognized and have dignity in that process. We also believe it's important for guests to be able to choose what they eat. Um, Choice is empowering And folks have all kinds of dietary restrictions, and some just have um, a history of working in the food system where they are given food, and it is the only option that they have all day. So making sure that folks, when they come into a community cafe, that there's more, more than one option for them is really, really important for us. Food has the power to bring people together, so this isn't just a community cafe model for people who need to take advantage of the services, but also for people who can support and give back. And some folks who come in, it's important that they leave the cafe and know and understand that they have something of value for their community, even if they don't have something to financially contribute. And so one of those ways is they can volunteer at any of our cafes, and we make sure that we have openings for people all the time to volunteer. Then, of course, we believe in excellent food. Um, We, you know, everyone should have access to healthy and nutritious food, and it's more than just calories. The USDA estimates that over 34 million Americans are food insecure. One World Everybody Eats envisions the community cafe model as a means of transforming the way we address this crisis. I do see pay-what-you-can models changing how we provide meals to those in need, and how communities themselves address food security long-term. I, I really think that the future of some of our food security systems and the way that we address people, provide dignity, inclusion, and all of those pieces really is encompassed in sort of the one world everybody eats model. And while um, some of the other systems are amazing and great, I think there is um, an opportunity for us to just do a couple things better, providing some choice, some engagement, um, and some direct services that are in a better way. I wondered about the financial viability and sustainability of community cafes. So I asked Julie how much revenue the cafes generate. What we've found is that our cafes roughly raise about 47% of their operating income every year. And it, fundraising is an important piece of each of these community cafes in order for them to be able to continue to operate year after year. And each of them has a robust fundraising plan, documented fundraising plan that helps them reach some of their goals. Finally, Julie and I discussed One World Everybody Eats plan to expand so that more people can enjoy these pay-what-you-can restaurants. We've only recently started reaching into some communities that we've identified to really um, see if we can start to identify some champions. And so I do envision that the longer term approach is really engaging communities at the municipal and or system level and then identifying champions. Um, And we think that's going to take some research. Um, And so we've sort of doubled down on uh, partnering with some universities to develop some of the research that it's going to take to be able to quantify and justify some of the outcomes, the long-term outcomes and health benefits, particularly as it relates to cancer prevention, diabetes prevention, and overall like improvement of social determinants of health. The One World Everybody Eats restaurants are spaces in which folks, no matter their financial situation, can gather in community to enjoy delicious and healthy food. Thanks to One World Everybody Eats and other imaginative business owners, Pay What You Can restaurants are popping up across the country to serve all of us. 
After my conversation with Julie, I was left with the question. What would the world look like if the value of food reflected our values? That's our show. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. And if you want more Money Talk, tune in to our next episode, where we'll explore the role of banking and finance in the food industry. Special thanks this week to Clara Thompson, Sasha Dubose, Kate Dario, and Liv cunnins berkowitz Meet and Three is produced by Kevin Chang-Barnum, Katie Mosman-Wadler, and me, Matt Patterson. Our audio engineer for this episode is Kevin Chang Barnum. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or would just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetin3.nyc. That's all spelled out.